So I'm Jason Perkoniak, and I'm here to talk to you about Kotlin multi-platform in um, Google Workspace. And I'm going to start by talking to you about multi-platform in Google Workspace in general and a little bit of that history before I begin switching over and talking about um, Kotlin. So for us, why multi-platform? And it's primarily about the consistency. For our users, we want to build something that has a consistent set of features across all of our platforms. So Android, iOS, web, server, we want the same features. And when we fix a bug, we want that bug fixed on all of those platforms. Um, a kind of nice side benefit is we get faster velocity because you write the code once, and you get that code on all four platforms. Um, but really, the main big benefit for us is really that consistency platform to platform. Um, and to talk about this, how do we build our workspace apps? Um, and our workspace apps are built right now with a shared layer that we write in Java, and we have a, a pair of specialized transpilers that translate that Java into JavaScript and Objective-C three, Objective C using an internal framework. And, it, and that code runs, again, on Android, iOS, web, and server. Um, on Android and server, that code runs natively in Java. On iOS, um, we use a transpiler called j 2 Objective C that's open source. And on web, it's Jackal, again, another open source transpiler. And then we have a set of multi-platform libraries. On top of that, we build a shared layer that um, consists primarily of our business logic. And when I use the term business logic, I'm using that term really, really widely. Um, to give you a concept, let me give you two examples. In Gmail, when we talk about business logic, we're talking about the system that synchronizes all of your mail from the server onto the devices and across all your devices, your drafts, your email edits, um, markings, starring your emails, all of that happens consistently platform to platform in a shared layer. Um, another example of kind of our shared code in Google Docs, that magical system where you see multiple people editing a doc simultaneously, that's written in shared multi-platform code um, executing identically on every platform. Because if you want that consistent user experience where people are editing text almost on top of each other, it has to be the exact same code executing on every platform, resolving those changes in the same way. Um, and so when we talk about multi-platform code and shared logic, we really are talking about basically everything up until up into a UI layer. Um, and so where does all of our multi-platform tooling that we use right now come from? Well, to tell you that story, we're going to have to go back. And when I talk about back, I kind of mean in computer science terminologies way back. Um, so in 2010, we had um, a set of issues we wanted to solve. And there were two big ones we wanted to solve. One was this consistency thing, and another one was code duplication. An example of a consistency problem, uh, in Gmail, people liked the star feature. But it was kind of confusing because Star only worked on some of the platforms and not all of them. Um, and so there were two kind of competing proposals about how we might solve these problems. One was kind of build a JS system where we would take our web-based system and embed JS VMs on all of the native app binaries. And basically take the web and move it to mobile everywhere. And another was to build a Java-based system using GWT on the web and use that same system on Android. So starting with like the JS embedded system, we did a lot of work building that up. And we launched it to users. And we thought the app looked really, really nice. And I use this told us um, very much otherwise that the native apps did not feel like um, 
their application. They, it felt like a web app, or it didn't feel real, or it felt laggy, or, or it just didn't feel natural. They didn't know how to describe what was wrong, but something was wrong, and the users did not like the, the embedded JS apps. And we spent a lot of engineering effort based on that feedback, and we got an application in that JS approach that came back and actually felt like a real native app. In fact, um, the feedback in the um, store from users was, oh, wow, they rewrote the application natively. We hadn't. It was just a lot of engineering work to, uh, to hide it from them. Um, and it was really successful. Um, up until a few weeks later, when a platform update changed the scrolling logic, and the illusion was broken, and it felt like a weird embedded web app again. Um, so that, that was that scenario. The other scenario was uh, based on GWT, Google Web Toolkit. And so the web app was written entirely in Java, and the Android app also in Java, where we shared this Java shared layer between the two of them. Um, but we had this Java UI on the web and this Java UI on Android that were different. And the successful part of that was this shared layer, sharing the code between them worked exceptionally well. Um, users weren't entirely satisfied with the UI experience on web. Um, and we were assured an iOS version of this app. Um, but the UI on web we knew how to solve. We could write a JavaScript UI that interfaced with the GWT compiled JavaScript code. Um, and we took some lessons away from this. First of all, the transpiler for GWT worked really, really well for code sharing. Um, and from both of these things, we learned users really, really care about native look and feel, whether it's mobile users on their mobile apps or web users using a web app, right? They're, especially when you get really large sets of users, they, there's just something intrinsic about them that's and they have trouble describing it, but there is a native feel that they care about. So we landed on that GWT solution, but we had to solve the iOS problem, which is where we came up with um, the aforementioned J to Objective-C, or as we like to call it, GWT for iOS. Um, and it was basically translating the parts of Java that GWT would translate into JavaScript, except we didn't have the UI toolkit that GWT had. So it specifically lacked any framework or toolkit associated with it. It was just translating the Java. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, it ran straight line code really, really fast. Um, it had some interesting pieces. Um, you could basically ignore the memory model. So we translated Java to Objective-C, but used the reference counting memory model from Objective-C. And most of the time, Java developers could ignore that. And the only time it became really important was around data structures, um, where we had to introduce some special Java annotations to deal with reference counting and stuff like that. But most of the time, when you're writing your program, you're not writing new data structures. You're just using them. So it didn't matter most of the time. And this actually worked out pretty well for us. Um, and this count built our multi-platform philosophy that we use today. Um, right, develop as much code as we can to as long as we can maintain the image that it's a purely native application easily. Um, and so that's don't write UI code, just write business logic. And kind of like the side effect of all of that is whatever you're writing, you're shared code in needs to have an easy interaction with that native layer. Which brings us to kind of like why we're all here today, which is Kotlin multi-platform. And honestly, it's much like the system we've been using for a decade. It's the same but better, right? It still allows us to build native UIs on top of this shared layer because it has this seamless integration with the native code path. Um, honestly, I feel like the keynote this morning kind of stole my thunder. Um, the, it, um, Kotlin multi-platform targets generally business logic, right? That's one of the stated goals. Um, it targets our key platforms that we, we work with, right? Android, iOS, server, web. Um, and it has a bunch of multi-platform features built in that make life easier, right? So it's 
has thought about like what should the consistent development experience be across platforms. So on Kotlin Native, they've built this garbage collector so that you can actually write data structures without having to worry about weird annotations on um, iOS. Um, expect actual uh, is another interesting one. We have like weird bid build um, artifacts in our current system to kind of achieve the same effect where Kotlin has a language feature. Um, and finally, the multi-platform community, our internal system, um, we, it works for us, but having a multi-platform community that supports us is just better. Um, and finally, I'm just going to briefly talk about like, our plan on how we're getting from there to here. Um, so we've got a bunch of transpilers, so why not build another one? Um, so we're going to build a Java to Kotlin transpiler so that we can translate this relatively large code base from Java to Kotlin. And this is going to let us continue to develop in Java while we're testing Kotlin multi-platform because um, we've got this big history of this. And one of the things we're going to be able to do is compare our Java to Objective-C code with the code generated by Kotlin native producing um, uh, bugs and features for the Kotlin compiler team and the Kotlin libraries team and allow us to continue to optimize the output of the compiler framework with them. Um, and we're really excited to do that. Um, and we're going, eventually we're going to check in, use this transpiler to check in that Kotlin code and then our teams are going to be able to take advantage of all of the other Kotlin features beyond multi-platform, which is also exciting. And where we are today, so we have a prototype of Google Docs that actually builds and runs with Kotlin Native, which is super exciting. Um, and we're, we've, we we're still like have some challenges in our transpiler. Most of our transpilations go from Java to less strict languages. Um, Objective-C and JavaScript in many ways are less strict than Java, and Kotlin is more strict than Java in many ways. So our transpiler is complicated, particularly around nullability and generics, but it works. And I, we're really excited to work on those uh, large-scale optimizations um, with the Kotlin compiler team. Um, where we go next, um, like I said, we're going to morph our transpiler into a code converter to do our check-in, finish updating all of the workspace apps to work on top of Kotlin multi-platform as the experiment uh, presumably succeeds, and then iterate and making our code more idiomatically Kotlin. Um, I want to talk about as the experiment continues forward um, with us experimenting in Kotlin multi-platform, one of the things we want to make sure we do is um, contribute, right? So right now, all of our developers are still developing in Java, but we should be able to still feedback bugs and useful performance fixes to our Kotlin compiler team and the Kotlin community in general. Um, plus, our experience writing multi-platform programs like this for a decade means that we're going to contribute to like the discussion of important features to the Kotlin language and the co and Kotlin in general. Um, plus, we have this huge suite of general multi-platform libraries that aren't specific to workspace. And where it makes sense, we're going to either, some of them just match onto like the existing Kotlin X libraries, and we're just going to contribute our tests or um, uh, like extend those libraries or find places where we can contribute them to the public where it makes sense as we kind of proceed forward. Um, and it's looking, we're looking for those opportunities as kind of our experiment continues. Um, and I just want to leave you all with um, my closing thought on what we've been thinking about. So Workspace has been doing um, Kotlin multi-platform style code for nearly a decade. And it works out pretty well. Thanks. Thank you.